So I'm about to introduce a young lady, but let me share some words with you first. Uh, there's a very exciting initiative that the provincial government has initiated to break down silos so everyone working to improve health and well-being in this province can be better connected. The idea is community hubs. A community hub can be a school, a neighborhood, a neighborhood center, or another public space that offers coordinated services such as education, healthcare, and social services. Some centers here are already part of the community hub, correct? But put up your hand, actually, if you're part of a community hub. A couple away in the back. I can't see anywhere else. But uh, so we, oh, yes, gentlemen right there. Fantastic. Well, the provincial government wants to create, do you have something for me? OK, great. <laughs> Okay, so uh, what was I saying? Yeah, well, the provincial government wants to create more of these hubs, but there are a lot of details to work out about how to make it happen. So Premier Kathleen Wynne, now I'm confused. Okay, is this the, that's what you just gave me, correct? Sorry, guys. Okay, so Premier Kathleen Wynne has appointed Karen Pitre, right, as special advisor on community hubs. The advisory group she is leading will submit their report at the end of June. Karen is here with us now to tell us how you can feed into the consultation process. Please welcome to the podium, Karen Petre. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much. It's uh, great to be here. I, I Actually, it was a great intro to Living outside the box, which I think that's what we're talking about today, and I actually like, I wrote down raw underbelly, um, which I have to say is there's a lot of things that I found over the last little while that have made life a little bit interesting. Um, I, I'm here today, let me just see if I can figure it out, yep, there we go, um, really to provide an overview of what, what we're doing right now, um, go through a little bit about the advisory group and what our mandate is, um, and really, we're here also to get your feedback on how best to deliver. And I know there's a number of people that actually do operate community hubs, and we're interested in those as well. Um, we talked about this a bit uh, in terms of the introduction, but there's been a lot of, uh, sorry, is that really loud? It feels really loud to me. But anyway, the provincial government has actually talked about hubs um, in a number of different statements. The poverty reduction strategy, speech from the throne, the budget, um, in a number of different areas. The one that um, we're working on now is really what's involved in six mandate letters. So those are six ministries, uh, ministers, I should be clear, that actually have community hubs in their mandate letters. And what that means is that they had been given instructions from the Premier to work on community hubs. And that includes the Minister of Health, the Minister of Education, um, community services. And what I would say is that when I got this job and I found that uh, it's not just six. The number of ministries actually that are really interested in having a contribution to this conversation actually is across the government. There's been a really widespread interest in this because it actually does bring this issue out of their silos. Um, and we're building on a lot of work that has already been done at the grassroots level. This, we've set up now an advisory group, and the advisory group actually is um, a number of people who have worked in government, because what we're trying to do, I call it moving the mothership. Um, so we don't have stakeholders at the table, and when I explain to people why, um, we look at the breadth of people who have an interest in this file. So uh, obviously community health centers, um, your organizations that are involved in this, we have childcare, we have libraries, we have community courts. It, it sort of seems to be covering a lot of different areas. So what we're trying to do and what we undertook is to put together a group of people that actually understand government and getting the information from people like yourselves that operate hubs, which is really to try and figure out how do we move what is a, many of the silos and the culture that exists within government to help what's happening on the ground. And the other part that's really interesting is that we've been um, actually centrally coordinated out of cabinet office, which for some people that's a little bit of inside baseball, but what that really means is we're at the center and having a strong team within cabinet office, we actually have a community hub secretariat now and it's a growing team of people 
that are trying to work with all the line ministries to figure out what this actually means and how we're going to deliver this for the Premier. Um, as I mentioned, we have uh, been doing a lot of outreach, but we've also been receiving a lot of impact, uh, input from a number of different sectors. And what we're trying to do at this stage, which is why I like the raw underbelly, is find out all the problems that exist out there. And this is not to say that we're going to solve all the, all the, have all the solutions, although there's a lot of people who think that's what we're going to do. We're going to at least identify what those challenges are, and we're going to try and figure out what it is that we can do from a provincial government's perspective to help what is happening, in many cases, organically on the ground. Um, we're looking at best practices. We've actually um, engaged a community partner. Wood Green is working with us actually to do some research and talk to a number of organizations in the field. One of the things I was quite insistent on, I think that a lot of people who receive their funding from government are often a little uncomfortable telling government they're doing a terrible job because that actually has a direct impact on how well they're funded next time. So we've given them a safe place to tell us all the things that are going wrong. So we're getting some great information and that's exactly what we're looking for. Um, this is really what I mentioned and in, in, we've set it up so that there is a survey and I know a number of organizations within the room have actually already participated in that. Uh, we're looking for you know, best practices. We wanna make it really clear that we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. The reason the Premier said that, well, she actually initially said, can you do this in 30 days? And I said, well, actually, could you just give us a little bit longer than 30 days? Um, she's got a very interested action plan or sort of agenda. But the reason that she was so insistent is she said, you know, we've been talking about this for 20 years. And there's great examples of things that have been working really well. So we shouldn't go and try and exp uh, study this. Why is this a good idea? Why do we need community hubs? Just tell us why what the province can do to actually make this easier and more seamless for those organizations on the ground. So we've already heard this. Um, the definition really, we're not gonna dwell on that and we actually, we're not gonna define it. It's defined locally, it happens organically. What we're trying to do is how we help that uh, process along. Um, again, this is more of what I would say, what we've heard in terms of some of the things that we need to do. I'd focus number one on the removal of the silos in the service delivery. And that may be easier said than done, but we're trying to identify what those look like and how we can move that forward. Our next steps in terms of what we're trying to undertake really is that we're having these kinds of conversations and we're asking people for really targeted feedback. So I've heard a number of times that policy doesn't work. And I said, okay, well that's great, but how would you fix it? Don't tell me it doesn't work, we've heard that before. We wanna know what it is that you would recommend that we fix. And we will try and take all of the information that we receive. This is not to say that this is the end of the conversation. This is very much the start of the conversation. But we want to try and identify some short, medium, and long-term things that can actually move this agenda forward in a way that will allow things to happen a little bit easier. And we, we are finding that there's common themes in all sectors. So needless to say, silos is one, approval of capital funding. There's a number of things that keep coming back, which we will identify as major barriers, and we're working with Cabinet Office behind the scenes to say, how do we, as a provincial government, try and fix those so that when we actually deliver something to the Premier, we know that there's actually a vehicle in place at the government level to do this. And I do have to tell you that there is a lot of work that's being, you know, sort of derived in community hubs, but again, because it's been done by ministry, it still t continues to operate in silos. So the nice thing about this, the good and the bad thing about this, is that having an identified person in charge of community hubs means that everyone finds some reason to find me and tell me what has to get fixed, which is great, and why we're building the team in Cabinet Office. It has been an overwhelming response, and I think that is the good news. People really care about this. You understand the impact that it can have on the ground, the challenge we now have and what we identified was the lack of leadership at the province. We need also to figure out a solution going forward in terms of how do we manage this going forward because while I'm doing this project and there's a cabinet office support, there needs to be a longer term solution for how we govern this type of process which is quite different and that change is what we're talking about so that we do things differently that we can add value to those communities and those citizens that want to see governments do a better job with the resources they have. 
So I think my time is just about up, but these are the kinds of questions that we're asking organizations to think about. And if I leave one thing with you, and I know we're going to come back and maybe have some question and answers afterwards, what I would really ask you is be very pragmatic, very practical. We can talk about all the policies and everything else. I need to know which policies, what legislation, what is it that you think we need to change? Because I can assure you that if we knew what it was, we might have been able to change it. So that is the request that the Premier has made to me. Why is it that we can't figure this out? I said, I'm working on it. Um, but we need your help. If we don't know there's a problem, I can assure you we can't even start to fix it. So we need to identify what those issues are. And we're looking to organizations like yourself to put all those hard questions on the table. And I'll look forward to answering questions after we get to the end of our program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen. So I'm sure lots of people do have questions, but we're going to get to those a little bit later, at near the end of the session. And I want to remind you that yesterday morning, when we talked about uh, a mapping exercise using the domains of the CIW uh, to map out new ways to start solving some complex problems, uh, we have some, I guess, results for you. So here with a report on what was learned at this session is Anna Pishkovich and, uh, from the AOHC and Penny Scott from Health Nexus. Uh, they're going to come up and uh, demonstrate. Good, good. But it's more than just a picture. And you can be on this mic, great. Okay, I'm short, so oh, there you go, Farley. Hi, everyone. Oh, yeah, I'm, on my I'm Anna, and I work with the AOHC and their Canadian Index of Wellbeing project. And for those that don't know, um, it's basically um, a little project that came together where a lot of, um, actually, over um, two, well, over two dozen of our members are incorporating the Canadian Index of Wellbeing into their work in some way. And it turns out that they're um, leaders, pioneers in the way that they're innovating and using the Canadian Index of Well-Being. Uh, the Canadian Index of Well-Being is a measurement uh, framework and it basically tracks, measures and tracks changes across eight quality of life domains or categories and they touch on everything from democratic engagement through community vitality to education. And so we're really emerging as pioneers and we're here to help support that work. And in our efforts, we decided we would get together with Health Nexus to take a look at our partnerships. Um, we were wondering, what do those partnerships look like? Who are we working with as AOHC members who are using the CIW as a tool um, to kind of shift the conversation in, the, in our work? Thanks, Anna. Good afternoon, everybody. Bon après-midi. So what you'll see up top is a network map. And what network mapping actually is, it's an ability to be able to get some data, usually through an electronic survey. And I want to say thank you to the early adopter communities for the respondents who did take the time very quickly to do some survey responses for this particular survey. But we not only ask demographic questions, we ask about relationships. And what the social network analysis software allows us to do is to be able to not only identify who those partners are, but to be able to understand the strength of those partnerships as well. We use some different scales when we talk about partnerships. I can be aware of you in a community as a different service. I know I refer people to you. Or we could be on that end, other end of that spectrum where, in fact, we're actually developing programs together or potentially even merging or integrating our services. So what we wanted to do was to ask the individuals who have been using some of the CIW indicators and domain indicators to find out what kind of partnerships they had begun to be involved with as a result of using the CIW framework. Network maps tend to look very messy. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit of what we're actually seeing in the map itself. We asked a couple of different questions and we layered a lot of information into these maps. This first map is actually a visual representation of all of the CHCs that responded to the survey and you'll note that those nodes, those are those circles on the map, 
Those are the CHC, so they're the light colored dots on the map. You'll notice that there's a lot of them in the middle of that network. That's the core of a network when it comes to network theory. You have the core and then you have your periphery. Within the core, the questions that we asked of those individuals were questions about who were they partnering with and what were the types of partnerships. The lines and the links, when we ask not only the demographic questions about what CHC do you work in, how long you've been with the CHC or the kind of work you're involved with, we also then ask questions about the relationships between the organizations with whom you are partnering. The lines and the links that you'll see between those indicate the strength of those partnerships. The sectors are the black dots on this map, and they cover everything from libraries to law enforcement. We found that the breadth and the depth of the relationships that have been established through using the CIW as a framework, in fact, are far-reaching. And the lines, if you'll note, the links are quite thick, especially in that center. That indicates the strength of the partnership. One of the other pieces that a network map can do, it can actually help validate what we know or what we suspect is happening out um, in the community as well. And it has the capacity, the software, to be able to filter and cluster different information as we're going through. These are static images that you're seeing right now that we've chosen, but in fact, this is live software, so we can manipulate it and, and we could play. If we had three or four hours and anybody was really interested, we're not gonna do that today. But what we did identify was if you look to the clustering on the right-hand side of the map, those are the Ottawa CHCs. And when we asked the question in the survey, what are the CHCs that you partner with in terms of delivering programs or designing programs using the CIW as a framework? They all named each other. That validated what we knew and what we'd seen as the stories that have started to come out of Ottawa in terms of the cooperation and the collaboration that was happening in those partnerships. We also were able to see with regards to um, some in the Southwest area as well, and this is a very small data set, so we actually only had about um, a dozen or so of the CHCs respond to the survey, and this was really to create a prototype to actually see what we could see about those partnerships. Certainly the strength of the partnerships between that region, and I think that's what we heard yesterday with Gary as well, is that there is a regional strength around the work that the CHCs are doing that will help amplify the work, not only within the work that the mandate of the CHCs have, but then also with regards to how those external partnerships are also amplified. Okay. And now moving beyond the obvious geographic patterns, We're going to be taking a bit of a deeper dive here, uh, looking into one of the Canadian Index of Wellbeing domains, and that's the Healthy Populations domain. And here you are really able to see the strength of the connections of our um, organizations and how they work, and you can tell by the thickness of the lines here of how strong those are. No, absolutely, and I think, again, what, um, what we've identified in terms of looking at a network map and understanding some of those patterns that we are seeing the patterns that we are seeing are a very strong central core in terms of the work and the type of work that's going on. Again, the length and the width of the, um, of the, the lines themselves are really the key to those pieces. So what next? This was a prototype, right, Anna? We, we, we thought we could do something very quickly to have some pictures to be able to use. The pictures are only part of the story because the pictures really are that point at which you launch off that you begin to understand who's outside in that network to be able to help your own work and to expand the work and the mandate that you already have. There's some tremendous leaders in this particular room that have started this process. And certainly Anna's gonna tell you a little bit in a moment about what are some of the other resources at the AOHC that can help you in terms of integrating some of the CIW framework into the work that you do. 
CHCs are uniquely positioned. Um, unlike, I think, any other organization in this province, you have the depth, you have the breadth, and you have the credibility to be able to make these partnerships real, larger, more creative, think outside that box, and bring in some unusual suspects. Look to the folks that you don't have around the table, because that's going to strengthen the work that you do. Absolutely, and this is just a friendly reminder to everybody that you know these are the ideal partnerships with our early adopters, but we really urge you to visit communityhealthandwellbeing.org. That's where we put all of the resources and share all of the learnings from all of our early adopters, so anybody that is interested in picking up any of this work, incorporating the CIW, it's all there for you. So I encourage you to come visit and to speak with us. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anna and Penny. And now to carry on with our theme of how to build collective impact, our next speaker is Andrea cohen Barrick. Andrea cohen Barrick is the CEO of the Ontario Trillium Foundation, or OTF, Canada's largest granting foundation. The foundations work to build healthy and vibrant communities through investments in human and social services, arts and culture, sports and recreation, and the environment. Andrea is a transformative leader. She came to the Ontario Trillium Foundation following a lengthy and successful career in community health care, with most recently as CEO of Unison Health and Community Services. I bet there are a lot of folks who had a, the privilege of working with Andrea when she was here, correct? Awesome. Andrea widely recognized, uh, is widely recognized for her expertise in making organizations more effective by ensuring that systems are integrated and impact is most me both measured and assessed. Please welcome Andrea. Hello. How are you? Nice How to meet you. you? Okay, what a great introduction. I kind of feel like I'm at homecoming or something. It's so great to be here with uh, old friends and colleagues and everyone who's also committed to building healthy and vibrant communities in, in Ontario. So I'm going to start with a little bit of uh, my own collective uh, impact. I, I've really gotten onto Twitter since being at OTF and I've got 2,918 followers right now and there's 400 people in this room and so the first collective impact exercise is to go to Andrea C. Barrick and follow me and we can get over 3,000 today. So let's see how that works. Um, it's great to be here as well to share the stage with Karen, who I had the pleasure of having a great conversation with a few weeks back on Community Hubs, both from my OTF perspective, because OTF has invested almost $18 million in the last three years into Community Hub activity, but also my perspective as a previous CHC person who was involved in the development of uh, two hubs, and uh, shout out to my colleagues at Unison. In fact, when I was uh, thinking about my remarks for today, I was thinking about a funny story. When I had the announcement that was out about being the CEO of OTF, I uh, all of a sudden realized, wait a second, this is kind of awkward because as a CEO of Unison, I'm actually in a fight with OTF right now about the funding for the hub and how it was going, and so I had to recuse myself and, and declare a conflict. Um, but it's been almost three years since I left the CHC sector and went to OTF, and over that three years, we've worked really hard to redesign the organization to better meet the needs of communities, to try to develop a theory for change for how we can have greater impact. When I was going through the recruitment process uh, to come over, one of the things that struck me is the similarity in missions of the organization. Unison, like many organizations in this room, had as part of their mission to build healthy communities. Ontario Trillium Foundation, is set to build healthy and vibrant communities in Ontario, and yet they couldn't really be more different in terms of mandate and scope. But one of the things that they did share was a challenge in defining what exactly that meant and trying to figure out how to demonstrate whether or not the mission was being achieved. So almost a month ago now, OTF launched our new strategy, and that strategy focuses on two things, really what we fund and how we fund in order to have impact. Our theory of change was that we not only need to look at the outcomes that we seek, but we also need to understand that the type of support that we provide really matters in helping organizations to make a difference. 
We're pretty excited about the new strategy, which is going to enable us to better, better measure the impact of our grantees and the impact we're having in communities across Ontario. In fact, since we launched on May 5th, we've done over 80 sessions in the province to date and had over 4,000 people that have attended these sessions so far. And actually, there's still 120 left to go, so if you haven't been at one, I, I encourage you to go out there. The feedback we're getting so far is that the transformation has been uh, well received. People are excited about it, and they're excited about what it means not only for their own organizations, but for the sector and how it'll really catalyze change. So, as Ontario's uh, funding agency, we've been around for about 30 years, uh, and we've funded actually, I think, something like 23,000 grants across the province. And with all of those grants, we've got really powerful stories that speaks volumes to the positive changes that we've been able to make through the investments. But as a public funder, just having those stories was no longer enough. Particularly in the value for money era that we're in, where there's increased competition for resources, where we know, and you know, that education's looking for stuff and, and we need to fix the roads and, and there's all kinds of demands on resources. We really need to be able to demonstrate the impact that we're having. Some of you may know, uh, before I started, but in 2011, the Ontario Trillium Foundation was subject to a value for money audit uh, with the uh, Auditor General. And now, I have to thank my, uh, my buddies at Orange, because they were also audited that year and took all of the attention off of OTF. So, so that's the good news. Um, but at the end of the day, there wasn't any sort of big scandal or anything like that. But what the Auditor General did say is that we really couldn't demonstrate how we were using that public money to, to make a difference. We couldn't really demonstrate what that was. So when I started as CEO, we began to have conversations with our board and our senior team and, and leaders in the sector on what we ended up calling our billion dollar challenge. And that was sort of like in the next decade, assuming similar funding levels, we're going to invest a billion dollars in the province of Ontario. If we're investing that deeply, what is the social return that we expect to generate from that investment? How do we know that what we're doing is actually making a difference? And so to start, we actually had to figure out how to define what healthy and vibrant communities actually meant. Instead of reinventing the wheel, we, we looked at our, our friends at the Canadian Index of Wellbeing, because uh, we thought it was a great comprehensive approach, academically rigorous, they've been around for 10 years, and they, we thought, great, let's let them help us to define what that means. We love the fact that their uh, framework aligned with Canadian values, and we thought as a government agency with our values as well. But of course, previously the CIW has only been reported at the national level, and we're a provincial agency, so we needed to know what that looked like. And so last year we funded the Canadian Index of Wellbeing to do a provincial report, and that's available online actually on the CIW website, uh, as well as the OTF website. And the report showed sort of where Ontario was relative to the rest of Canada. And, and we then used that report when we were doing our strategy development. The report showed in one of the domains, which is healthy populations, of course, our, our health overall is improving. We're less likely to get depressed. We're living longer. There's a significant drop in teenage smoking, particularly amongst girls. But at the same time, there's lots of room for improvement because 10% of Ontarians don't feel as healthy as they used to. And as many of you know, diabetes is on the rise and, and flu shot rates are plummeting. And I would say what that data probably doesn't show is for particular communities, those stats actually look worse. Um, I, don't, <laughs> I don't have to tell this crowd that uh, our health is also affected by the environment, access to public space, our financial security, and, and the engagement and sense of belonging that we have in our own communities. And in fact, over the past 10 years, OTF has invested almost 16 million in, in CHCs across the province because we really believe that they're well situated to help us deal with some of those determinants of health. Many of those grants are collaborative in nature, in fact, recognizing that some of the issues are complex and can't be solved by a single organization alone. But back to the CIW, we needed to be focused on what we fund to have the ability to clearly measure outcomes. And that's what the new granting strategy is going to focus on. So, when we got the report, we were essentially able to narrow the 64 indicators down to 12, which we felt reflected our mandate and mission, were aligned with government priorities, but also that we felt we might have the chance to, to improve over a decade, and that was really important. So we know the CIW has lots of great stuff like the number of women in parliament, 
but we didn't pick that one because that's not really relative to our mandate, even though it's important overall. The 12 indicators that we did pick became our six action areas, and they determine what we fund and that we're going to use to create communities that we all want to live in. Communities where people are active, inspired, connected, where youth have opportunity, and people contribute to a green environment, and most importantly, where they can be prosperous. These action areas are all focused on people, you'll notice, rather than on organizations, which is a shift in how we're thinking about our impact. We need organizations to have the impact, but the impact is at the people level. They also reflect our aspirations of healthy and vibrant communities. The other part of our theory of change then is the how. How we fund is really critical in how we're able to have an impact. So in late 2012, we did a survey of over 1,400 applicants and grantees, which was able to benchmark us against similarly sized foundations. And I have to say all of them were in the US because there's nothing else like us in Canada. And we heard many ways that OTF was very helpful to organizations, but we also heard that we can do better to help grantees to amplify their impact. In order to build capacity for results, organizations need deeper investments over the longer term. One-year grants are great for certain types of projects, but not for longer-term change. We also heard, and I can say I knew personally from my experience, that our administration, from, from the application to reporting, was actually really heavy for the dollars given. And we wanted to change so that we had fewer rules and processes and fewer, um, fewer barriers so that we could have our grantees spend more time on mission and less time on our paperwork. That usually gets applause. <laughs> we're also going to be able to provide more support to make sure we get the results that we're looking for. So in addition to what we're going to invest in, how we invest in the short, medium, and long term also becomes important. So rather than a one-size-fits-all approach that we'd had in the, the past, we're taking what we're calling our balanced portfolio approach. So our new granting streams are specific to the nature of the project and also when we expect to see results. Like any investment strategy, we want to see some results now, but we want to also invest more deeply over the longer term for longer term impact. So we can have our streams help seed new ideas at the conceptual stage to help grow what works by building on the success of a proven model, expand access to community space with our capital dollars, and most importantly for today, we have a stream that supports collective impact. It's the, something completely brand new for the foundation. And we're looking at bringing about fundamental change through collective action. Grants for long-term systems change, deep investments of up to five years. Collective impact going to target complex problems. And those are problems that aren't solved by straightforward technical approaches or typical activities. You all know that the health of our communities is dependent on so many factors. Factors like poverty, youth unemployment, clean environment. Issues that have been around for a really long time and in unfortunately are not moving in the right direction. And these type of problems are known as complex because they've been seen as intractable, often in spite of much past effort. We know a lot of organizations are developing or have developed key actions and plans. Um, ideas are, are afoot. There's all kinds of levels of government and other foundations that are, are working to do that. But they often do so in isolation. I commend everyone's good intentions on that so far, but despite these efforts, these complex issues continue to be prevalent and they continue to impact on community health. At times, in fact, just defining the problem can be really demanding and can require different perspectives and the input of many different stakeholders, since the causes are often interdependent and multi-causal. But the good news is, the solutions to these problems can potentially come also from collaborative efforts that operates in ways that challenges conventional thinking, and things like Farley talked about at the beginning, and practice. And, and that's really what the collective impact approach is all about. It requires trusting relationships, a holistic or a big picture view of the problem, pooling of resources, and the harnessing of collective synergies and expanded skills. The approach allows collective impact member organizations to combine different views, objectives, philosophies, resources, and working practices to address a common challenge. At OTF, we want to support the implementation of these approaches across the province. We know that we can catalyze systemic change, which is why we've launched the Collective Impact Stream. And so you're in for a treat now. We have the worldwide premiere of our Collective Impact video, which is not going to go on our site, 
for three more weeks because you'll see at the end it references what the uh, uh, granting criteria and information are. And that's not on the site yet, which is why the video is not on, but we're going to share show it right now just as an overview. Ontario Trillium Foundation is the largest granting foundation in Canada, and we invest in projects that will result in change that matters to communities. We fund projects through four investment streams, and they're designed to meet the size and the need of your project. These four streams make our investments more focused so they can generate the greatest impact. So what are Collective Impact Grants? They're grants that support organizations from many sectors that come together with a shared understanding and a common approach to work on one big, urgent social problem. These organizations bring different perspectives and different expertise and agree to align their work and use shared measures of success. It's more than collaboration. It's a shared commitment to do things differently. So, are you considering a collective impact model? There are five conditions broadly accepted as defining a successful collective impact approach. They are 1. A common agenda 2. Shared measurement 3. Mutually reinforcing activities 4. Continuous communication 5. Strong backbone support So, what could this look like? Imagine a town Their big issue? To tackle obesity they embark on an initiative to take on a multi-pronged community-based approach to lower obesity rates for their residents, especially young children. So, the town gathers 15 partners, from nonprofits to school boards and teacher groups, to public health nurses and municipal parks and rec staff, and even local restaurants. They come together to find ways to make the healthy choice, the easier choice for local residents. The initiative is overseen by a steering committee of all partner organizations and over 25 interested stakeholders who hold regular meetings to keep everyone in the loop. Together, they identify several different yet complementary strategies to make a difference, like running a healthy dining program with over 40 restaurants offering lighter menu options and school cafeterias serving healthier food choices. Updating school health policy so that school nurses are trained to assess and help overweight students. Upgrading local parks and creating new ones. Laying down new bike paths and walkways so that physical activity becomes safer and more inviting. Helping nonprofits deliver cooking programs for parents and adopt a bike programs for their kids. All of this is accomplished with a dedicated support team to keep everyone moving in the right direction. Over time, all project partners are able to measure their success. The outcome? They find the proportion of obese students declines significantly and their average weight gain is reduced. In the end, these organizations chose a collective impact approach because they wanted large-scale systems change and were prepared to do things differently to get there. So how does OTF fit in? For the first time ever, OTF is supporting longer, deeper investments so that Ontario organizations can take a collective impact approach to solving a complex and systemic community issue. We know collective impact takes time. That's why our model offers funding support at various stages of an initiative. From doing the groundwork and building the case, to developing the proposal and actually implementing the initiative. We'll also support evaluating the results during and after the grant so that others can learn from your work. Think the Collective Impact Grant is the right fit? We're here to help. For timelines and granting criteria, visit otf.ca. All right, and so the reason it's not on the site is we don't have the criteria up yet either, but it will be in three weeks. <laughs> And I don't know if you've been on our site lately, but we've actually got videos on each of the action areas in both French and English, and, and we'll have the same on the investment streams if you want just that quick blurb and not have to, to read through a bunch of stuff. Um, but that was the overview of the Foundation's collective impact model. And we want to provide support to encourage various levels of government, other funders, the business community, service providers, and residents to be able to collaborate to identify systemic issues and systemic solutions at the community level and beyond. 
So how are members of the AOHC positioned to help lead collective impact in Ontario? Uh, in a nutshell, I would say well positioned. And why is that? I'm going to end with my uh, top eight list of uh, why AOHC members are, are well positioned for collective impact. The first is collective impact approaches require a level of sophistication and capacity to work across sectors and across multiple stakeholders. CHCs are grounded in the determinants of health. The very foundation of the model is to take a broad systems view and work across sectors. Secondly, collective impact initiatives are informed by and based on credible and proven evidence, at least of the need, and ideally regarding outputs and outcomes. We know CHCs have demonstrated history of using evidence-based approaches and also adapting them to diverse community contexts. Third, collective impact requires processes for meaningful community contribution and engagement in the design of the strategy and the initiatives. Both by mandate and by experience, CHCs have the trust of their communities and believe in a community development approach to working on issues. Four, there's an understanding that collective impact work is emergent and adaptive. And it's understood that learning occurs amongst partners as the initiatives move through this, the phases. CHCs are and have been agile and adaptable organizations that are committed to learning and also applying that learning. Five, collective impact requires shared measurement and commitment to ongoing evaluation. And for OTF, our collective impact grants will be aligned with the CIW indicators. CHCs are well positioned as they've been working with the CIW for years and are committed also to using shared tools. Six, the funding total available for a collective impact project can be a maximum of $2.5 million, which may be inclusive of early grants for concept formation, development, proposals, and implementation because we want to make sure we're funding all of the early stage work as well as the implementation. And that's not a small amount of money. We need organizations that have the capacity to manage these large-scale grants and complex reporting that comes from multi-stakeholder projects. Most CHCs have been operating in this type of environment and have well-established operations. Seven, OTF investments and collective impact will preferably lever be leveraged, and not just for financial impact reasons, but also because the scope of the issues to be impacted should most often be significant enough to demand multiple funding partners. CHCs have solid relationships with other funding partners and can bring them to the table on collective impact approaches, which will help to ensure the longer-term sustainability of efforts. And lastly, collective impact requires a deep understanding of both the assets and the challenges of communities. CHCs couldn't be as effective as they are without continually committing to understanding at a deep level. So I'm pretty excited about the possibilities that OTF can catalyze with our collective impact stream. But like any of our investment streams, we only bring the resources. It's only half of the puzzle. We need partners and communities to help us deliver on our mission and on our goals. Partners who share the same values and who are committed to creating change that matters. Partners like you. Look very forward to our future work together in achieving our shared goal of healthy communities. Thank you. So we're going to go into the Q&A portion of this. So let's uh, thank Andrea once again, please. OK, so let me just find my note here. OK, so we have the four mics. So you can step up to your microphone. If there are any questions, I can't, uh, unfortunately, I can't see very well. No questions? That's a good <laughs> oh, question. Here we are. <laughs> okay, if you just tell us who you are and state your question. Please. Sure. Um, my name is Bronwyn. I'm at Parkdale Community Health Center. And I was just interested in, I think it goes both to the community hubs and the funding strategy at Trillium, just the role of the government or the funding agency of sharing some of the interesting work that other agencies are doing. So that came up yesterday, if there's been an interesting project or an interesting 
um, engagement activity that someone's been doing in Thunder Bay and got funded for and has been recognized up there, how does that get shared with someone in Ottawa or a CHC that's interested in doing sim similar work in London? I'll start, I'll start but I'll pa it's actually an interesting question because for the provincial side of things, there is nowhere and we're starting to actually build that. And one of the comments actually we had at a meeting this morning was, let's start to put together all the information that we're collecting as part of this exercise and make sort of a best practices. But I was just saying to Andrea, there are so many points of intersection in terms of, you know, what we're trying to do at a provincial level and in, in many ways Trillium is actually further ahead, um, that there should be some synergy. So I, I, I um, am a big believer in not reinventing the wheel and if we can figure out a, a mechanism to actually make that information available to and, and let people know where they can share that, I think that's a really important first step. Thanks. Well, we had longer than 30 days, so. <laughs> um, so great question. One of the challenges, and I won't even speak across government and across funding agencies because I can tell you actually within Trillium we have difficulty doing that knowledge sharing and, and figuring out what works. Um, part of our strategy map, actually, we've embarked on a knowledge management strategy, both internally and, and meant to be externally in the sector as we look at transparency and, and open data. And our vision for the future is that, in fact, all of our grants will be posted in a searchable database on our internet so that organizations who are looking at working in a certain area could actually say, well, what else is OTF funded or is there something else like that? Um, and that's important, you know, both in terms of idea, but if we really want to look at replicating and expanding what works across the province, we have to give access to what is working across the province. And, and our hope is that we'll then be able to kind of uh, start this evidence base that, that others can use and that we can use to, to demonstrate the impact that we're having. Great. And we have someone in mic number two. Yeah, hi, it's Heidi Schaefer. Um, I have a couple of questions. Well, one of them just that came up from listening to Bronwyn is that CI in our sector, Collective Impact, stands for Community Initiatives. And we do have this shared measurement space that is being, that it now is working really well and is starting to be really used. And we have a huge opportunity for Collective Impact around some of our CI work and sharing that. And yesterday when we heard about food security from Jeremy Pacharos getting really excited about the potential for us to look at, in terms of knowledge sharing, what we're doing with food security and scaling that up using a collective impact. But that's not my question. <laughs> uh, that was just, uh, my question is in the, um, to you, Andrea, that you're using the CIW with the collective impact strategy, some of the indicators. And where does belonging, because that's something we've made a commitment to as a, across all our, our, our members, where does belonging fit in that work? Have you, have you got that as an indicator? Yes. <laughs> the longer answer, okay. Um, interesting you talk about CIs being community initiatives because actually at OTF it's always been community investments. And so we're getting tripped up continuously as, which CI are we talking about now? Is it the collective impact or the community investment? So initialisms are challenging. Uh, sense of belonging is one of the 12 uh, indicators that we selected. And it's the indicator that that funnels into the connected people action area that we're looking. And when we were looking at selecting which indicators out of the 64 that we were gonna pick, that one actually was really important because when we talk to the folks at CIW, it's also the indicator that, um, that is the strongest in terms of how people feel about their well-being. So that, you know, despite all of the other stuff, you know, no matter where it was, if they had a strong sense of belonging to their communities, they actually felt healthier than, than all of the other ones combined. So, so that's in there. All of um, the information, uh, if you're like a, a data geek and you like to look at that, it's, it's all available on our site in terms of what are the indicators, what's the background, or how are the metrics used, how did we select them, and, and that's all, all open for anyone who's interested. I'm, I'm not going to touch on the indicators, but I just wanted to say one of the things that we've heard from a number of people that everyone is using a different metric. And so we're never comparing apples to apples. And I don't know what the answer is. You've actually advanced the discussion quite a bit further. Um, but that's within ministries, between ministries, across government. So 
I don't know if this is the new metric or whether everybody's using different metrics, but it would be really good if everyone actually used the same way of measuring things because that's a huge problem. We've heard that in a lot of the feedback that we've received and therefore you can't actually evaluate something using the same um, base standard. So I'm not exactly sure if everybody's using the same standard, but we've heard that as a big problem within the different sectors for sure. Great, thank you. Um, Mike number three. Hi there. Uh, my name is Paulos Gabriesos from Unison Health and Community Services. It's great to see you up there, Andrea, but my question is for Karen. <laughs> you answered all the questions for Unison. Um, and um, Andrea referred to the fact that Unison actually now supports two community hubs in uh, the city of Toronto. And, um, and it's been an interesting experience. And one of the challenges that we've got in supporting the hub partners is that each are beholden to a different funder with that funder's defined expectations and objectives. And the challenges of building, uh, if you will, a collective impact without designated collective impact funding is that um, each agency is feeling that it's too risky to commit to something that is not written into their funding contracts. So I wanted to sort of bring that back to yourself and to your conversations with the Premier to say, what are the opportunities for those funders to all be informed and move towards a more collective impact kind of framework? Well, this, this is my great chance to turn it around because what would your advice be? Actually watching, I just said to Andrea, the collective impact video, I said I'd like to share that with a few people because it's actually really interesting and some of the um, conversations that we've been having with the various ministries is exactly that question. Um, we have one agency that gets six, 17 different funding streams from the government, three of which would be even within one ministry and all of them are different. So we'd like to propose that we actually turn that around that the ministry, the, the organizations should make one approach to the government and the government should figure out within itself what those 17 deliverables are. and any advice that you would have in how to do that in a more effective way. That's why it was really interesting having had the conversations that we're having and then seeing it visually is actually something that I think there is a, a real desire to figure that out because from the people working on the ground, the challenges of managing different deliverables, different timetables, different reporting structures is a complete disincentive to doing anything actually collaboratively or so. We're very aware of it, and I, again, I keep turning around the question to say, any advice you would have that says, even if we say this is what we're trying to achieve, and if you have suggestions about how, how to do it better, that is an issue that is right at the top of our list. I don't have all the solutions, that's why I keep pointing back to it. Okay, I believe that's it for the questions. Yeah. I know there are two people, but the question is, I have a question, do we have time for the questions? And I'm being told a, a strong, unfortunately not. Um, I'm just the messenger. <laughs> so at, at this time, so folks, I don't know if you guys can maybe take sort of one-on-ones. Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. So both of our guests would uh, entertain your questions directly if you identify yourselves. So thank you very much to Karen and Andrea. Very much appreciated. <laughs> <laughs>